What is up, guys? It is Scott. Back with another episode of Scott Talks. Today, we're going to be talking about primetime Sanders and him leaving HBCU Jackson State for Power 5 School Colorado. But first, before that, I want to introduce my two co-hosts, Dionysius. He's back. You guys know we talked earlier in this season. Welcome back, Dionysius. Thank you, Scott. Always a pleasure to come on the podcast. Always a pleasure having you. And Zora, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Scott. It's nice to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so again, these are two my fellow classmates here at Xavier. D, you guys met um, earlier this season, and Zora is a freshman here at Xavier by the way of America and has some interesting experiences overseas. Yes, I did. All right, so let's get right into it. I mean, a few days ago, actually during the SWAC championship game, right after that, it's announced that Deion Sanders is leaving HBCU Jackson State to go to Colorado. How how are we feeling about that? Um, interesting decision, nonetheless, with uh, how Deion Sanders was talking about coming into the program and changing sort of the sports culture when it came into Jackson State University. Uh, I can't say I'm surprised, though. I feel like, um, me personally, it's a business decision. While it does hurt and uh, it doesn't make sense with how the way he was preaching about bringing uh, recognition into HBCU sports, it is a concerning factor with letting, like, sort of using that culture to advance into other aspects of business and college. Definitely. I definitely agree with you right there that definitely was a business move again. I mean, with any coach, they usually always start at a smaller school and work their way up to those big-time offers. Um, but like you said, I mean, he definitely came in there, and he did deliver on him changing the culture of Jackson State. I believe this season they went – 11 and 0, um, they won their playoffs. So he definitely did his promise. I mean, they were 26 and 5 in his last three seasons. Yeah. They won back to back conference championships in the SWAC. Um, he signed the number two recruit, Travis Hunter, this past year. He won the 2021 Eddie Robinson Award. So this is a guy that he, he did his thing at Jackson State. He put these guys, he gave, brought the attention in the media to um, HBCUs, and he won. I mean, yeah. again, when you got a star at that level to come down to HBCU, that's a blessing, but. You know, he, he's also making a business decision again. He's taking his son and some of the best players with him to um, Colorado. But there's this is the part that I want to talk to both of you guys about. This whole notion now that... I think it got messy towards the end, very yeah. much so, which is yeah. what we're all talking about now. And that's exactly we're talking about, how it got messy and just how... I think, again, I have no issue with him leaving. That That's not my issue. But my issue is the way that I'll kind of, you know, we get an ESPN story almost mid-game about... Dion's leaving, he's going to Colorado, he'd already been on visits, and then all this footage gets released. So again, I'm again, we, we don't know for sure what went on in that locker room or whatever, if he did actually talk to them before. From the video, it seems that, you know, the players weren't necessarily crying, you know, mm -hmm. they had a good relationship with, they were all very thankful for Dion. But how do you guys just kind of feel about how that, just, just how the whole news broke and how everything just kind of went down in that situation? I mean, I think with the response that there is, Really, the more at the end I've seen it on is like, you know, when I'm on TikTok and I'm scrolling through and of course you just go through the comments and it's a lot of people talking about, oh, um, Jackson State and like a lot of the people who used to go there who are like alumni or still go there. It's like the response where people are saying, oh, you know, you guys should be grateful that he did this and, you know, all this other mess. But it's like, you know, they're hurt, obviously, because, you know, Dion, as you said, came in, changed the culture and now like he's leaving after such a short time. But like, again, if he's going to try and do that with, like, other schools and not just Jackson State, obviously he has to move on. Yeah. But I think it's also, like, it just ended really, really sour. And, like, also just the response is, like, people are like, oh, you know, people didn't care about HBCUs. Like, he put y'all on the map. It's like, who didn't care about HBCUs? That's a great yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah. we That's go to point. one. We're at an HBCU. We cared because we wanted to come here. And it's like now, of course, Jackson State is on – the bigger stage, looking at ESPN's looking at them, and, you know, now it's like there's a chance for HBCUs to really get that spotlight, and I think Dion did do that, but let's not also act like there wasn't already a culture, a history, okay. like a support system yeah. behind these HBCUs, which is why I feel like it also hurts a little bit more Definitely. because of how much these people, these alumni who go to these schools and really wanted to see him possibly, like, build longer. Definitely. But, like, again, that's, like, that mix between the culture of HBCU culture and like sports culture Definitely. and like just looking at bigger schools and D1 schools. So there's two sides to that, of course. Yeah, I agree with that with definitely seeing how 
it's bringing a lot of people in who didn't know about Definitely. the HBCU spectrum and a lot of about the HBCU culture. But we, like you said, it's nothing new to us Definitely. because we already knew about all of this stuff going on. HBCUs have been around since the late 1800s and will be around till the 3000s. You Definitely. know what I mean? Their HBCUs aren't going anywhere. So I feel like it's the way he went about it sort of opened the floodgates for a lot of people on the outside. Definitely. Not because they like we kept them on the outside it was more so of a not caring about it aspect of staying on the outside like it wasn't a factor to them or they just remained oblivious to it because it wasn't something that affected them and it wasn't got part of their or anything. it got televised and now everybody is like oh they have these think pieces on hbcu like oh yada yada um y'all should have did this 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 and this when it's like we've been doing this Definitely. consistently for years to come if hbcus were struggling and failing they would have been done in the 1900s during a time of a high uh racial tension in america and high just disdain and oppression going on hbcus wouldn't have survived that if definitely what they were saying were true about hbcus and no one cared about them I mean, so clearly there is a care for hbcus and there still will be a care for hbcus Deion sanders i feel like doesn't affect that mm. Definitely, and I think that just goes into my next point. Like you guys are both saying, there's been a culture at HBCUs, not just with the sports, but HBCUs are one of the best um, universities to, for African Americans um, and other people of color to get degrees. So, mm -hmm. of course, you know, we're looking at this from a sports aspect because that's what Dion kind of made the world look at. But like he said, like you guys are both saying, HBCUs have been around for years, and they're not going anywhere anytime soon, and that they have a rich culture and history that, like you guys said, these outsiders and people who maybe aren't familiar, okay, cool, They these past three years when Dion's been there, yes, they're tuned in now because he's there, and this is a high-profile um, NFL Hall of Famer, but Jackson State has always had an amazing band. Jackson mm -hmm. State has had that arena for a long time. Jackson State has had those fans for a long time. So win or lose, all those people are still going to support Jackson State, and I think that's the point that a lot of outsiders aren't getting is that people don't support Jackson State because Dion was there. Maybe right. some outside yes. people, but those alum, they're going to come to every homecoming because they went to Jackson State. They don't, I don't care if Jackson One State was 0-11. They're going to come every so, game yep. because, again, that's their school and they have pride in that. And I think that's the hard part for the um, outsiders to understand is that people love these schools because of their pride. This is where they went. They had a family member who went there. Mm -hmm. You just have that lifelong connection. Again, we go to Xavier House down here in Louisiana, but I also feel a special connection to just anyone who went to an HBCU. And that's something that some people who go to different universities don't get. And I think that's the part that a lot of people are missing. I think that goes into my next question. With this, what do you guys think it will take, though, for HBCUs to really start getting that recognition of top guys coming, or, um, top ladies coming, and when people can start seeing that, okay, people aren't just here because they didn't have any other way to go. Like, no, people want to genuinely play at these places. They want to genuinely attend these schools. Well, one thing that I agree with uh, Deion Sanders about when it comes to football, it's not the skill positions. It's no way, no shape or form the skill positions because I feel like I could take, I could take a wide receiver or running back from an HBCU and put them on a – against like a D1 wide right receiver run back and he still get busy. Definitely. It's it's the O line and defensive line where a lot of those guys, those big guys up front is where it lacks. Definitely. That's because that's where most plays happen. You know, your D line and your O line is your prime defense and prime offense. So once we could start bringing in those big guys and big recruits to HBCUs, it's it's a I feel like the shift will change with football because a lot of you know when you play Pop Warner middle school and maybe even some high school ball at some schools, a lot of it is just big. Definitely. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of it is just, oh, you're a big guy. We're going to put you on the D-line and O-line. In college, especially in the NFL, it translates to a lot of technique. And once we begin teaching that technique, it's it will translate more into larger aspects of sports because a lot of it is – yeah, you're big, but you also have to have some technique with being big. I mean, of course, Definitely. it's also, like, the time that goes – that gets invested into this in, like, facilities, of course. Like, that's always, like, this conversation when it comes down to it. It's, like – because a lot of these guys, we're looking at the these players, like, really the only difference is, like, they were able to get access to possibly these high schools and stuff like that, and a coach being, like, or looking at these schools and being able to move there and, like, looking at D1 schools and stuff, like, because I remember, like, when my brother was playing, like, football in high school. Like, when a lot of these guys were going to, like, these private schools, 
of course, you got that money, so you're able to get those resources, get those connections to learn how to talk to other people and get into, like, training and stuff like that, at least from what I saw. And, again, you were already talking about, like, skill players. Like, a lot of these dudes played together and know each other, and it's just, like, the direction just split, and it's a little Mm -hmm. bit different. So, because even when we are talking earlier about, like, just talking about basketball, like, you sometimes you can put an HBCU basketball team up against this D1 school, mm-hmm. and they'd be yeah. like, oh, yeah, you can come play with us, you know. Uh, it's HBCU teams. It's going to be easy. It's going to be, it's gonna be and that's raps. But, like, yeah, these players going to still put up, put that work in. It's mm-hmm. also our XU, you know, our men's basketball team played Notre <laughs> Dame. Okay. Yes, we did take the L, but it wasn't bad. Okay. Wait. Like, it wasn't that much of a margin where we got, like, blown out. Like, it was, like, what, 14, yep. 12 points or something like that? Yeah. And it's Notre Dame? Like, like, yeah, come on. Yeah, like, we got the opportunity. We got the mm-hmm. chance to do it. It's just, like, you got to put up, like, against the competition where we're able to be put into those, those put spaces. up against those teams, I guess, in yeah. those spaces. And then we can still be on the come up. Like, and I think that's a point that you just said that I want to talk about is that, like you said, a lot of these players know each other. A lot of them, they played in the same teams growing up. They played, um, you know, for the same travel. They go to the same trainer. So it's not like, oh, these HBCU guys are necessarily getting – Less of a, you know, whatever. Like, they're still putting the same amount of hours, putting the work. The only difference is the camera time they're getting, like, you know, again, certain people might go to, like, big Catholic schools mm-hmm. or big schools, whatever, and, you know, in high school. But a lot of the times when certain players get recruited, now, of course, you know, skilled players are going to usually be four- and five-star guys. But there are some guys who, you know, they, they just don't get as much exposure, whether it's the state they're in, the district, whatever, but it doesn't necessarily mean they aren't just as skilled as some of those other guys. Mm-hmm. So just even going back to it, like you said, I mean, these H, a lot of these um, Power 5 schools, they schedule HBCUs as a money game where they pay them to come you know, so they can get an easy win. But this year with the SWAC um, Pac-12 challenge, we've seen the SWAC schools, these HBCUs, they're winning. Jackson State's woman team, they beat down someone earlier this season. Um, same thing, too, with Alcorn, Texas Southern. Like, these guys are holding up against, you know, again, the schools are supposed to be better and have better players. So, again, I think that with HBCUs, of course, with anything, rankings only help you when you're not on the court, the field, the track, yeah. whatever. But, again, then they still got to come out and compete. And, again, something like um, that you've seen, you, you're a big volleyball fan. You've seen we have some very talented players at our school. Do, are they getting as many televised games as maybe – um, some of the Big Ten schools like UMD, Wisconsin, et cetera. No, okay. but they still put in a bunch of hours. And again, this isn't saying that they're better or worse than any other players, but the main difference I just feel with a lot of the times is just how exposed other people are to your game. Because at the end of the day, you still got to compete. You still got to play, you know, yeah. whatever. So and We yeah. just changed conferences to, like, also for our volleyball team. So we're going to talk about volleyball, like, just real quick. Our ex like, women's volleyball team. We've been conference championships for the last 12 years. Consistently. 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 Like Consistently. Back Our women's volleyball back team is like that. We're at HBC, back. but we're beating PWI. We're beating PWI. Because, yeah, again, it's like that. only thing that changes is exposure. But talent talent like, is everywhere. So and now shout out to our ladies. Yes. Shout out to the women's volleyball team. We're playing against other teams now being the RAC. But, again, first year they came into the RAC after being the GCAC for, like, 40 years, like, we won the conference championship coming into that. And, like, all it is is just continuing to build with these players and to continue to play against people that are really going to challenge them. Definitely. And, like, that's always what we get into with the NAIA. Like, once we play against these teams, and if we can play against them consistently, like, our team's going to continue to be building. And that's the one thing with HBCUs we always talk about. Like, yes, we didn't have that exposure before. And, again, like, with Deion Sanders being put at Jackson State, that man – he he's going to create some waves. He created yep. some waves for real. Yeah. And like if we can get other NFL players and it, like basketball players to come back and even if it's for a year or two just bring like just attention. to bring the just attention. Br- yeah. Sometimes that's all it takes and that's what he basically proved. Yep. Cuz speaking of the exposure in um connections and things of that nature, a lot of the recruitment process for high schools have shifted over the years. Because it's not just about, oh, um, I'm going to go to this coach, I'm going to send them my game film, and we're just going to go from there. You still send out game film, but a lot of these connections come from um, camps, going to camps, getting invites to tournaments to play in, and things of that nature. So a lot of these coaches, especially like 
to funnel schools into HBCUs and things of that nature, a lot of these high school coaches have connections way back when. Definitely. Like, oh, my dad went to the – my dad knows the uh, dad of the athletic trainer yep. of Alabama and something like that of nature. We don't have those connections mm. because we weren't allowed in those spaces. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's that's historically that we don't have those connections. You know what I mean? And we're just now sort of getting that exposure and starting to develop that connection of of having those mm-hmm. sort of intertwined things with sports and that nature. Because like, we're, mm-hmm. like I said, we're years behind when it comes to stuff like that. Even yeah. with, like, the NBA, I swear they made a post. I don't know when it was, probably a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago. It was like I think they were celebrating that like more than half of the coaches in the NBA are like black now. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, dang, it's twenty twenty two. And we are highlighting now that more than or half of the, the coaches that we had in the NBA, which again, we look at the NBA, we look at the players that we have, but now once we get into the actual administration like actual control and actually being able to just not be the talent yep. that's supposed to be helping these teams. Like we're actually being in those rooms, having those conversations and taking control. Like now it's becoming black, yeah. which yeah. is crazy. Some to me sometimes like, and it just shows again with HBCUs, this is a stepping, this is a stepping yeah. stone. Like this may be this situation, like the si- situation that we have with SWAC going on right now. And the way that this is kind of like blowing up with, the disrespect either from like Jackson State fans with Deion Sanders and like yeah. just all that going on. Like I just hope that who we can get past this because like, yeah. this is like yeah. building more on our schools, like our yeah. HBCU schools. Like this mm-hmm. is a bad instance. But again, that goes for both sides, having respect and also understanding that at the end of the day, you gotta do what you gotta do sometimes yeah. when mm-hmm. it comes to your profession and again mm-hmm. just Keeping your last time. And, and, and I think that's the part that is so interesting to me that, that you mentioned and the point that you mentioned. L, for instance, LSU, a powerhouse, they have a bunch of, um, you know, in the past, especially 10, 20 years, powerhouse for football. Black players weren't always allowed to go there. So, again, you know, they get all the time. Mm. They didn't have their first black player until 1970, which, again, sounds like a long time ago, but that's only 30 it's not or 50 that long. years. The NFL's been around for, you know, how long? So, again, there's a lot of great NFL players. Um, Shannon Sharp, for instance, went to HBCUs. And again, maybe do they maybe want to go to some of these other schools? Sure. But mm-hmm. they weren't allowed to go to these schools. So I just think it's interesting to look at that. And then also, too, like you're saying, you know, respect on both sides. And again, it, it's a career choice. At the end of the day, coaches change schools all the time for a better opportunity. Yeah, that's no dumb. that's no secret. The only reason why I think this one got so much attention is because it's Deion Sanders again. And the huge, you know, in the response of HBCUs and all that. But like coaches all the time, for instance, um, Benedict's uh, college coach, D2, HBCU, he coached at um, Howard, he's coached at Southern, he's coached all different places, and again, in different roles, but again, no one ever gave him backlash for that, because again, coaches are going to do what not only best for them, but best for their family too, and again, Deion Sanders is also a father, you have kids who you want to take to the NFL one day, hopefully, so you know, put him in the best position, I'm not saying that you can't get drafted at HBCU by any means, but... You, he's looking out for what he thinks is his career. That's yeah. the thing. It's happened, though. That's another thing. Is that people act like, oh, you're going to HBCU. It's happened. It's happened. Like, we've yeah. had people, it's NBA, happened. like, go to the NFL. Yeah. Like, yeah. coming from our school. In, in, in recent years, too. In, in recent years. Like, that, yeah. that's the one thing. The NBA has to do a little bit better of a job. But I think they're doing taking the right steps with um, the different all-star camps and HBCU combines and stuff. But the yeah. NFL, they, they have HBCU play. They have – with Chris think Paul, like with his t- the HBCU tip off with Chris Paul, mm-hmm. and then speaking of the NFL, oh, they they just had I think almost I think it was over five or six, maybe seven um, HBCU players drafted in the draft, and they had a bunch of other guys who were you know free agents, so like undrafted free agents who got signed. So again, it, it's not that the talent's not there because the talent's clearly there. It's just again, just exposure, and just making it whatever. So I definitely agree with both of you guys that some yeah. stuff this was got to change, but. From we're changing the time. We're changing it, and I feel like that scares some people. Oh like, also, because you got to think about you, you got to think about where some of these schools are. I love the SEC. I love Kentucky. I'm a huge Kentucky basketball fan. But you got to think about it. Alabama, Louisiana, Georgia, Georgia all have a plethora of black talent. Now, you imagine if some of those players who go to LSU, Georgia, Alabama, the powerhouses, go to their in-state HBCU instead? Because but what do you think that comes back to? I feel like then it's always like, oh, so then what resources are going to have that are going to help them? And, 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 and I think that's what comes as a, as a recruit. That's another thing, too. I think it's, I think as a recruit, you 
you ultimately are, again, you pick a college based on your what you want to do as a career. Mm-hmm. And if, if you want to go to the league, again, I'm not saying that HBCU can't get you there by any means. Mm-hmm. But if you got a coach like Nick Saban, Big O, um, some of the other guys who have a track record of getting guys with similar builds or similar, you know, Star high school to you, yeah. then again, I'm going to go with the formula. So it's not that, you know, you can't go somewhere else and still do it. But if I know this guy has a proven track record of doing something, I'm going to go where I feel like my career is best. And that's why people transfer, because they and feel like this is no longer the best for them. And you got to think about it, like we said earlier, connections. Yep. Your coach, like, you know, you go to a D1, D2 school, think about uh, Michigan's coach, uh, Star Row. Yep. Um, he can... You know, he sees you be playing, and he knows you about to go to the league or something like that. He's like, hey, man, I got you a, uh, yep. I got you a little workout with the such-and-such such NFL team. Uh, I'm going to put you in contact with this coach. I'm going to put you – you know, those connections, you know, that's that plays a part with the recruitment. You look at Nick Saban and coaches like that, look at his – you know, you got to look at his accolades and things of that nature. Yep. It's just – it's not that HBCUs, we don't have – those accolades and things of that nature, we're just catching up on that spectrum of the accolades and mm-hmm. developing those connections. You know, we're we coming. Yeah. <laughs> we getting there. Give it a couple we, years. We're getting there. I mean, as you guys see, we're getting there. First off, huge thanks to Anisia and Zora. I greatly appreciate you guys again. Put their links in the um, description. They are both MASCOM majors as well. They have some dope work. They also help me out with the sports content at my school. So they have their own personal um, goals and stuff. So definitely check out their pages as well. Anisha also has a podcast. Zora is an up-and-coming journalist as well as reporter. So, again, make sure y'all check them out and show them love. And, yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Appreciate Scott. it. All right. Scott out. Peace. Peace. Appreciate y'all.